a lot of people today who would look in the 21st century and think, well, the Bible used to be relevant. The Bible was relevant in my grandfather's day or in my grandmother's day. But why is the Bible relevant today when we have so much knowledge, we have so much money, we have so many popular people, we have so many things going on in the world? Why would you say the Bible is relevant? Well, I'm going to touch on three things that I believe prove and show the relevance of the Bible today. Number one, I believe the Bible tells us about the quality of life that God wants us to live right where we are living today. You know, God, of course, wants us to be in heaven, but I want to show you that the Bible is relevant in where you live today. And secondly, I want to show you that the Bible really is the best book and has been for centuries the place of hope for humanity that provides and proves its relevance. It's a place of hope. And thirdly, the Bible reveals what I call the good news or the details of the good news. Sometimes you hear about good news. Somebody say when you sign a document, you need to look at the fine prints. Well, the Bible provides the fine print of the good news of the gospel. So let's get right into it. Why is the Bible relevant today? You know, it's very interesting that in today's world, with all the money we have, we have never been as rich across the world as we have been today. We have never been as prosperous. If people are able to travel. People are able to go to universities, to school. People are buying cars, buying this, buying other. Money is flowing all over the world. And yet in the middle of all the money, all the technology, we still find lacking truth. We still find lacking things that are meaningful. We still ask the question, what is life? Why am I here? What is my purpose of existence? Well, the Bible answers those questions and that's why it remains relevant. I don't know if you realize that the increased knowledge, increased money, increased prosperity, increased popularity and modernity, there's also been an increase, uh, uh, well, I would say a decrease in the quality of life for many people, even though they have more stuff. But the quality of life that has to do with peace, the quality of marriages, the quality of love, the quality of just, just life itself. There are more people today with all the money we have with all that we have, more people that are hooked on drugs, that are deeply involved in the cesspool of immorality and sexual immorality. There is like a desperate grabbing by people, killing themselves with drugs, killing them, their souls with illicit and wrong activities that are, that are mean and, and more mass weapons of destruction, more guns in the hands of people to hurt one another, more violence of man against the other. Yes, we have moved forward in many areas, but the quality of life, the quality of life is still missing for many of us. So what does the Bible say about this issue of quality of life? We know what the academics are saying. We know what many are saying. But have you ever thought about the Lord's Prayer? In the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, I believe this is key to us, for us to understand what Jesus is all about and also, consequently, what the Bible is all about. And this is the only time the disciples have asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And Jesus, in his prayer to, in, in his teaching to man, says, after this manner you should pray. This is in Matthew chapter 6. And verse 9, he says, pray like this, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That in itself, my friend, that first part of the Lord's Prayer is a big indication that we need information about what it is in heaven that we are to pray that needs to be done on earth. And that is the relevance of the Bible. Jesus went on to say, give us this day our daily bread. And he said, forgive us our trespasses, our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. ever. Everything Jesus taught us to pray about 
in Matthew chapter 6 has to do with the quality of life that God wants us to live on the earth. God is a good God. And the Bible is relevant because it gives us the details of this expectation of God. It gives us the details of what the quality life would look like. It, it gives us the expectation that God has a plan in heaven. He says, Lord, for your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, all across the earth, all across the cultures of the earth, people use the term heaven to speak of the best quality of life. No pain, no suffering, righteousness, justice. Things are in order. Things flow the way they ought to flow. Do you believe in the beginning when God created the earth, the earth operated the way God wanted it to until sin entered into the earth? So when we are praying for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth, that is a direct invitation. It's like a light going off in my heart, in my life to say, you know what? There is a plan that God has today and this very day as he sits in his kingdom, as he sits on his throne, as he's surrounded by the angels of God, as he's surrounded by, by the, the host of heaven, worshiping him. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for my family. God has a plan for the earth. God has a plan to establish his kingdom principles, his kingdom quality of life, to come to people and to rule in their lives and to cause them to experience what heaven is all about on earth. So wherever you live today, you can pray the prayer that God's kingdom would come and God can change your quality of life. Wherever you, you, you go to school, whatever your neighborhood is facing, you can pray to God this kind of prayer. Lord, I want your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wouldn't that be wonderful for you to experience on earth, in your neighborhood, in your nation, in your community, with your family, what God desired in heaven? For you to have the relationship, to experience love, to experience peace, to experience the career, the job, to experience the government, to experience life, the quality of life as God wanted it in heaven. He said, well, Pastor Peter, that's really speaking about when you die and you know, at the end of life. No, this was the Lord's prayer. And we know it is, uh, re it's relevant today because it says, give us this day our daily bread. So we're not talking about a life in heaven. We're talking about a life on earth where God is involved. And then he says, lead us not into temptation. There are no temptations in heaven. It says, and deliver us from our trespasses or forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There are no debtors in heaven. So the entire Lord's prayer is about what God wants to do in earth in your nation, in our nation here in Jamaica, in our families, in the quality of life that we should be living on earth. And in fact, sociologists have found, researchers have found, researchers at the George Washington University have actually found that people who pray and go to church recover quickly from their sickness than those who do not. They've also found even mental, psychological uh, emotional and even intellectual help and health and benefits from people who have entered into this relationship with Jesus. They have read the Bible. The Bible has become real to them. Marriages have been impacted. Children who even grew up in very, very terrible situations when they have come to Christ and have given themselves to reading the word and have looked to the word of God. Their lives have been changed. Their families have been changed. In fact, you look through human history, wherever people have read the Bible, believed the Bible, trusted in the word of God, implemented the teachings of Jesus Christ, the quality of life increases. Sociologists will tell you that. Social scientists will tell you that. Wherever people have lived out the Bible, their quality of life increases. 
I dare you put up your your uh, whatever you're using and looking at and musicians, you may have a muse or whatever you, you are trusting in. Put that up against the word of God and compare the quality of life. If you're honest and your truth, you'll realize the word of God is way through the roof. And that's what happened in John chapter three, when a man named Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, I know that you're a son of God because all these things are happening to him. That's like someone would look at Christians and says, what is different about you? And it's Jesus. It's the word of God. It changes the quality of life. And look at what Jesus said to this man if he wanted to experience a better quality of life. Because, you know, life in the kingdom of God is a better quality than life outside the kingdom of God. Just like some nations of the world, you know, you may say you have a developing economy. Life in a developing economy country is different from life in a developed economy. It's just different. The way they drive, the way you eat, everything is different in a developed country versus a non-developed country. The same thing, my friend, is true. Life in the kingdom of God. And what Jesus said is, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. This is in John chapter 3 and verse uh, 3. He says, I say to you, you if unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Basically saying, you need to have a citizenship in the kingdom. You got to take a trip. You got to take the plane. You got to go to that developed country to see how different it is. You think you have everything, but you do realize that when you touch that developed country and you realize how things operate, it is a whole different system. The same thing with the kingdom of God. That's why we pray that what is happening in heaven would happen on earth. And he gives us that expectation. That's what the Bible is here for, to tell us that there is a different kingdom and we can change the quality of life. So Jesus says, you can see the kingdom. But quickly, I want to show you that Jesus didn't just say, come take a plane and see it. Because you could read the Bible. You can hear some messages. You can come to the church and just say, yes, I'm a Christian. But it's more than just being born again. It is being born again. And then it says in verse um, 6, it says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You know, I always say to people, it's one thing if you come to Jamaica on a cruise and you stop and move around to Donzeri Fall and to, to Rick's Cafe and you move around. And you say, I've been to Jamaica. Well, you, you've been to Jamaica. But in order to enter Jamaica, you've had to spend some time and you've got to, you know, get a tour guide or get somebody who, who can walk you through. And that's what the Bible is talking about here. He says, if you want to enter in the quality of life that God promises, that is that he brought down to he from heaven to earth, you need to enter by the word of God. That water is represented in the scriptures of the word. So you have been born again by the word. The word opens your eyes to what the quality of life that God has to give is all about. You are hurting yourself when you ignore the Bible. You are diminishing your quality of life when you do that. Let's move to the next thing. So the Bible also, I think, is one of the greatest and the only consistent place of hope for mankind. Do you find that people are just not very hopeful today? You know, the fact is you might be born in a situation and without the revelation of the scripture, you would feel stuck. You would feel like there's no way out. Well, John chapter three again, John chapter three, Jesus said to Nicodemus in verse nine, he's, he says that, I'm sorry, verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But it says that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. And Jesus went on to say, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You see, the Bible is relevant today because of the lack of hope in the earth. Our politicians may run a great campaign about hope. Singers may sing about hope. Uh, you have people even are promoting drugs and all kind of religions in the name of hope. But consistently through the history of mankind, and again in the 21st century, it is the word of God, the Bible, 
that unlocks and reveals to us where hope lies. Hope is in God. Hope is in Jesus Christ. Hope is in walking with the Holy Spirit. Hope is in the word of God. Amen. So that's relevant. Why is it relevant? Because people have not found hope. I mean, if the world had found hope, then there would there'd be no need for Jesus. There would be no need for the church. But as we live longer, we find out that this is a hopeless world. We have found out, we are seeing that all the things that the devil and the world, and whether it is money, whether it is power, whether it is profit, whether it is popularity, whether it is gold, whether it is bigger and bigger, how all the things that we have hope in, quickly vanishes when we are sick and when we are faced with reality and when we are honest about our soul, what's going on on the inside. We recognize there's hope. In order for there to be hope, there must be a purpose. In order for there to be hope, there must be an end. In order for there to be hope, there must be righteousness. And that's only found through the word of God. I want to move along quickly to the last one. The word of God reveals to us the details of the good news. You know, someone can come and tell you good news. And I think one of the things about people is that sometimes we listen to the headlines, but we don't read the story. We listen to the loud proclamation. We listen to the song, to the beat, but we don't hear the philosophy, the ideology, the details. So around the world, you know, there's been a lot of people who have, uh, put forward their own opinions. For example, in African nations for years, um, the chief or the king, uh, what would call the medicine man or the man who's strong in, 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 his, in some witchcraft or something, they would say that he has a closer contact with God and he would be above all the tribe members. And so everybody had to go through him. In fact, today there are still many, many tribes and clans and groups and kingdoms and so forth all across Africa and all across the world, really. And the individuals at the top of the food chain is treated as if they are the goal, the, the gateway to God. It happens all across the world, not just only in African nations. In Russia, I'm told that the priests of the Russian Orthodox Church, they are the interpreters of God. So the priests of the Russian Orthodox Church, they say to the Russian people, we know what you should be. We know what God wants. We are the interpreters of God to the people. They know tradition and they know the ways of God. So in other words, they have to go to the priests of the Russian Orthodox Church in order to know God, in order to find about God, to get details of salvation, to get access to God in Asia. I'm told that it is the that it is the gods that your family worship that helps you with the God of gods. And I'm told that some people are born godlike. They are gurus. They are brahmas. They are people of light. You know, there's a caste system. Huh? They have access to God more than ordinary people. They are wiser. They can have access to God. So there's like a tier system now across Asia. In fact, after the World War II, one of the things that had to be done among the Japanese emperor was that he had to tell the people, I am not God. He had to renounce the sense of deity. Well, we see that coming back in many ways. Even you have political leaders and singers and, and calling each other gods and all those kind of things. Because, my friend, there is this sense of tear system. Ordinary people couldn't access God. In the Middle East, Muslim and Arabic nations, uh, within that culture, I'm told that God cannot relate to corrupt man like you and me, and, and he doesn't talk to a woman. All right? we, therefore, we need a prophet. We need an intermediary. And that the prophet Muhammad was the last intermediary of God. He was God's prophet. And we are told that we cannot be children of God. We cannot be close to God. We, the best we can do is become slaves of God. We, so there's this culture, there's this distance between God. That's the revelation that comes through the Quran and some of these books there. But in Europe and in Americas, in the Caribbean, South, Central, North America, we find that we need priests to ascend God, to address God. God is confined to an activity in the church. 
in a beautiful temple on a Sunday morning is confined to some work within the church. There is a class of people whom we have assigned and designated and paid to do the work of talking to God, dealing with God, accessing God. We also question the need for God or the role of God since we are so scientific, since we are so modern, since we are so successful, since we are so knowledgeable. Why do we need God? So we, we, we are struggling with that. And we have a lot of reasons and a lot of things we are doing that ignores the teachings of the Bible, that diminishes the teachings of the Bible. We feel God is for the poor or for those who can't help themselves here in the West. Academic and scientific and technology have been elevated to the role of deity as equal with the Bible or more valuable than the Bible, more wiser than the Bible. That's where we are living today. And across the world, we see that the superiority of men and the superiority of races or the superiority of career or certain talents or superiority of certain fields of study, various levels of superiority structures, they create a block between everybody else and what God is and who God is. And so what the Bible does, my friend, is that it reveals the details of God directly relating to mankind. That's the beautiful thing of the Bible. That's why it's, re that's why it's relevant today. The Bible cuts the leg of oligarchy. Oligarchy. Oligarchy is, means a system of structure in society where elites control everything. Elites believe and they set the pace. But the Bible undercuts all of that. Because the Bible, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Jamaica, here in Jamaica, we have a big problem with men and probably women also in some community. They set themselves up or they've been set up as dons. They call them dons, like gang leaders, and they basically rule a territory. And they're given authority, no constitutional authority, but they're allowed to function. But the Bible comes and undercut the power, the authority, the influence of gangs and gang leaders and dons and even political leaders that undercut the word of God. Why does the Bible do that? What is the relevance of that, my friend? What the Bible does today in the 21st century is that it gives men not only information and how to have a better quality of life, not only information and how they could actually, you know, begin to, to know God from themselves and find hope, find hope for themselves so that they are not, their hope is not built on a politician or on military. They are not hope on their, their hope is in a higher power in God. That's big. I mean, the third thing the Bible does, my friend, is give every single human being information on how to have direct access to God. It's called the priesthood of the believers. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is one of the most powerful things to understand the relevance of the Bible today. Today, you and I can have access to Jehovah God. Amen. Let me just give you one scripture that emphasizes this. And you can look at Genesis, look at what God did when he created it. it was good. God started out with one man. He didn't create a nation and then spoke to the government. He didn't create a church and then start speaking to the ecclesiastical leaders. He spoke to one man and he walked with one man. And I want you to know that that's what God is after. He wants one man, one woman. He's a personal God. The relevance of this, the word of God today is this access that we have to God. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12. And I've, we're going to close and We'll come back to some more teaching on this, on the relevance of the word of God in areas of our lives tomorrow. And I want to invite you to get somebody to come back out to, to, to join us in this, because um, I believe that God wants to share something with us in this area. By the way, if you have questions, send us a question, leave us a comment. We'd love to try to help you on this journey. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you want this quality of life that the kingdom of God offers, Reach out to us. We'd like to help you with that information. It's not hard. 
Jesus wants you to have quality of life. He wants you to have hope and he wants you to have the details so that you can have direct access to God. You, the same access that I have to God, God has made a way you can have it. There's no preacher. There's no guru. There's no apostle. There's no bishop that have a, a greater access to God than any other human being on earth. This is why the Bible is relevant. It cut through all of that hierarchy and caste system and pride and, and that oligarchy that is pushing upon the earth today. You look, my friend, the world is going back and back into controlling others, controlling others. Big people with money and influence controlling other people. The Bible undercuts all of that, all of it. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. I've said that before. I want to emphasize it again. Hebrews 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we lay aside, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the crown, despising the shame, and I sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Look at the next verse, verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Verse 4, you have not yet resisted in bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exaltation which speak to you as to son. Look at down at verse 18. So here is Jesus. We're looking at Jesus. All this is happening because of our Lord Jesus Christ. For you have not come. So now we understand it. Jesus made a way. You have not come to the mountain that cannot be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. That's not where we are today. There was an experience that directly describes what the Israelites felt in Exodus when they were invited to come up to the mountain of God. And if some of you feel that way when you talk about God, when you, when you think about accessing God, when you think about going to church, you're thinking, oh man, it's going to be dark. It's going to be tempest. It's going to be voice of words. And oh, I, oh I'm going to be afraid. But no, that's not where we are. Verse 20. They could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a heart touched the mountain, they would be stoned or shut down with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Some of you have, have felt that way with God because of your sin. You know the wages of sin is death. You feel you're not worthy. You feel you could never live up to the standard of God. So you run in the opposite direction. You could not attain but I want you to know that what you're feeling is not what God is doing. God is doing something new because of Jesus. There's no more need to be afraid of the church, to be afraid of the Bible, to be afraid of the word of God, to be afraid of the truth. You don't need to be afraid anymore. You don't need to run away. God is not coming with this attitude of judgment. He's coming today with an invitation in Jesus Christ. There will be a day of judgment. There will be another day for when these things will be brought into account accountability. But during this dispensation, I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity that you have. Look at what we have today. This is where we are. I see, sometimes as individuals, we, we act as if we are still living in the Old Testament and Jesus did not come. We need to realize that there is, was a Christmas, there was an Easter. We are no longer in the days on earth before Jesus came. Look at verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Welcome to the kingdom of God. To the heavenly Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels. To the assembly, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. 
you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirit of just men made purpose. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than Abel. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for this time today. I thank you for the opportunity to speak about the relevance of your word. I pray you'll speak to someone's heart and that you will enable them to see the details of this great kingdom is available to us today through the word. You have made it possible. It is relevant for the kind of life we can live. It is relevant for hope we can find. It's relevant for the details about how we can walk. Lord, we are not. To, we don't. We are no longer afraid, and we don't have to be afraid that fear can be dealt with through Jesus Christ. Continue to guide us. Continue to open our eyes to Your Word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for you know spending this time with me and uh, just being here on Facebook together. I pray that you learned something. I pray that uh, something about the relevance of the word of God will stir your 